We are now live to tape. So again, good day to all of you. I hope that you're well. And uh, I suppose some measure of congratulations are in order because we've now reached our last class of this semester. So those of you who have stuck with the agenda and stayed with the program and have been attending or at least watching the recordings asynchronously, and those of you who are getting your assignments in on time, whether in my group or indeed in your own respective breakout groups, uh, I'm glad and hopeful that you will complete your final pieces of work and end up uh, passing this course and, uh, and then moving on in your studies. So we began this journey in August, seems a while ago, uh, and here we are on the last day. So just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Firstly, to my own uh, students in Section M, um, the, uh, you know, my own breakout group, which, which is 80 of you, actually it's a very large group, uh, you know that your final essays uh, will be due a week from today, and I will open up the portal on Blackboard uh, probably this evening. I don't expect any of you to get them in today, but obviously if you want to get them in early, then that's fine. Late is not so fine. I have a deadline as well by which I have to get all my grades in. So as you probably know from other city college courses, or I hope you do, that we as professors cannot really miss our deadlines. So if your work uh, is not in in a timely way, you do run the risk of an incomplete and that in itself can be remedied because you have a number of weeks into the next term to complete the, the assignments and get them in. Of course, that just adds to our workload and adds to your workload. So it's always better to be on time if you can manage it. And I'm mindful that this semester has imposed unusual difficulties on all of us. So I, for one, am being more lenient with respect to tardiness. I'm not penalizing people for undue lateness, uh, particularly if they email me on the day of the due assignment and say, I'm sorry, Professor, I'm having problems, I'm falling behind. Uh, those of you who have not communicated with me whatsoever, and then a month later said, oh, here's my essay, that's not so good. Um, that's negligence on top of tardiness. So we understand delays in getting your work done. And we tolerate them and I don't penalize them owing to our unusual situations. But you must not be negligent and, and please do communicate, those of you in my group at least communicate with me if you're going to be late. At least reach out to me and let me know that you're on the ball and, and that way I'll expect your work, okay? So we've got to, we have to collaborate um, basically in order to get through this. So that's point one. Uh, point two is that as advertised, uh, as mentioned to you all, I will not be covering any new material today. We've reached pretty much the end of what I wanted to cover with you this, this term and this third section. So I am opening the program up, or the lecture up rather, to review. And my aim is to entertain questions that you may have. So in the first instance, I'm inviting you either in the chat room or verbally to ask anything that you want to ask in the first instance pertaining to the materials that we've covered in this third section of the course, starting with Zeno's paradoxes, continuing with Anselm's ontological argument, moving on to the prisoner's dilemma in the two-person case, and then onward to the n-person case. Um, tragedy of the commons, free writing, and all of these scenarios that stem from that. And then ultimately to Newcomb's problem, which we uh, discussed last week. So uh, do any of you have any questions uh, pertaining to any of those materials? Again, does anyone have any questions 
pertaining to those materials. Professor, professor there's one in the chat. Uh, okay, good. Have you been able to hear me all along, by the way? Yes. Okay, thank you, because I just lost the, I mean, the room just dropped and came back on very quickly, but I was muted when it came back on, so I was just hoping I haven't been uh, talking to thin air uh, as long as, because uh, th this is also being recorded for the benefit of those who, who aren't present, but let me look at the chat room then uh, and see what's in there. Um well, I, I, I just I just see a yes. Uh, ah, here we go. Okay. So Melody asks, I was a little confused on how the prisoner's dilemma can be resolved. It can only be resolved during the iterated case when you apply strategies such as tit for tat, or can it also be resolved during the one-shot case? Good question, Melody. Um, and I may, in answering this, run the risk of confusing you further. Uh, when we talk about um, resolutions, normally we're talking about a resolution of a resolvable problem, right? It's like we could talk about a paradox. And as you've seen uh, during this section of the course, we showed how Zeno's paradoxes can be resolved. So th those, in a sense, are resolutions because they uh, effectively wipe away the paradox. They, they tell us how the paradox arose in the first instance and how indeed it may be dispelled through correct or sound reasoning. So that, that is what technically we mean by a resolution. But in a dilemma situation, uh, one doesn't really resolve it in the same way because the dilemma remains. Uh, the, the, the structure of the prisoner's dilemma in particular is not going away uh, and uh, no matter what the actual outcome is. So in the one shot case, uh, the two players will independently make their choices and the outcome they get is the outcome they get. And by no means does it uh, suggest or imply that the dilemma is resolved. It just means they both made a decision and got an outcome. So in a certain sense, we have distinguished between, you may recall, Melody and others, we've distinguished between individually rational choice and collectively rational choice. You remember that? Um, that, that? That's a significant way to think about answering your question. Good. So we had in the earlier part of this course, starting with Descartes, I think pretty much assumed that rationality was something that went on inside each of our, each of our own heads, so to speak. So, you know, you're reasoning with your own mind in some sense, um, and it's in a way, as Descartes would say, divorced from the physical world. It's just what's going on inside your own mind. Uh, and you can be perfectly rational doing mathematics, let's say, or doing, uh, doing logic without any real connection to the outside world. And that's a kind of conception of rationality that entails the individual um, as the agent, as the rational agent. And I think that when we moved on to other people's discussions of issues that Descartes raised, we've seen also for Barclay and his conception of existence, it's really an individual perception uh, that constitutes the existence or non-existence of something. It's not what others perceive because you can't perceive what others perceive. So it's only what you perceive. Um, in that sense, uh, perception is individual. And, uh, and, and so on some accounts, so, so would ontology be individual? Certainly epistemology is individual. You presumably know what you know and what you think you know, but you can't know what anybody else knows uh, or what anybody else purports to know. You can only hear them tell you, but you can't know it in the same way. Um, and Plato's journey is one of, of individuality also, is it not? It's each of us who has to with our own minds apprehend pure forms and so forth. So I think that both explicitly and implicitly all the way through the course, albeit in, in different philosophical contexts, I think it's fair to say, and correct me if you disagree, uh, but I think it's fair to say that the, our notion of rationality uh, has been really an individualized or an individuated notion all along. Um, is that fair to say? When we talk about rationality, we mean someone is rational or not. Yeah, it's individual. Um, but when we came to the prisoner's dilemma, we suddenly saw a different picture emerge. Uh, and that is the 
the distinction between the two attracting points or the strong attractors in the model, namely the Nash equilibrium where both prisoners have defected or indeed the Pareto efficient or Pareto optimal outcome wherein both players have cooperated. So then the, the outcome in, in a prisoner's dilemma, whether it's one shot or iterated uh, melody and others, uh, the outcome is not decided by an individual. The outcome is decided by the joint choices that both players are making. Because you could make your choice, but then there are still two possible outcomes, right? Depending on what the, the other prisoner chooses. And similarly, the other prisoner could make her choice, but there are still two possible outcomes depending on what you choose. So in that case, the outcome that's attained is not a function of one mind. It's a function of two, or not a function of one decision maker, but a function of two. And that's only in the two player case. It gets more complicated when we go to the end player case, but sticking with two players, therefore it, it, what emerged from our evaluation of the model is that rationality can be considered to be individual, but it can also be considered to be collective. Because in a certain sense, the uh, dominance principle is individually rational, but it leads to collectively undesirable outcome. That is where both people defect. So in that sense, what's individually rational could end up being collectively irrational. And on the other hand, a cooperation, which would be prescribed, uh, it is prescribed by maximizing expected utilities. Nonetheless, you are taking a chance uh, when you cooperate because you could open yourself to the sucker's payoff, which arguably is the worst individual payoff, just in case you cooperate and the other prisoner defects and you get the sucker's payoff. But cooperation is the only choice that leads to collective rationality, right? That leads to basically the best collective outcome or the best overall outcome for both players. So we could say that cooperation is a collectively rational choice. And I think that becomes much more pronouncedly obvious when we're dealing with N persons and we want to avoid the tragedy of the commons. Yeah, like it may be individually rational for you to dump your garbage in the ocean uh, if you're living on, on, the, on the seaside just because it's the easiest thing to do. Um, and that may be called individually rational but on the other hand, if everybody does it, if 7 billion people are doing it, then we see what we're seeing, which is the oceans being degraded and polluted and, and, and accumulating huge patches of garbage. So that's obviously irrational, collectively irrational. So the dilemma isn't really resolved. Back to Melody's question, I'm trying to explain that we don't really uh, use that word resolution in terms of the dilemma. What, what we use is uh, more like language that describes whether the outcome is going to benefit uh, one person or a very few people in the end player's case, or whether it's going to benefit a majority of people playing the game in the end person's case. So we can only talk about outcomes being Pareto optimal or, or perhaps uh, you know Nash, Nash equilibrated, but that's not a resolution. That's just an outcome melody. So is that helpful to you? If you don't think about resolving the dilemma, but think about getting what you deem to be the best outcome in the dilemma, then um, I think your question would make more sense. So are you now more confused or less confused? Less confused. Well, that's a good thing. Um, although at the beginning of the course, I wanted to confuse you. Now that we're on the last day, I want to clear up. I want to clear up, if I possibly can, any lingering confusions. And I'll just say one more thing, because your question came in several parts. Uh, so can it be resolved during the, the iterated case? You know, if we take the same perspective uh, and start applying strategies in the iterated case, uh, in view of principles, which basically are for the one shot case, we find the same issue that there is no single strategy. There's no unitary strategy that's going to resolve the dilemma in any way whatsoever, because we can apply the same reasoning to the iterated case. Remember, I told you Axelrod's sort of axiom, um, which is that there's no best strategy independent of environment, meaning if you have a bunch of players applying different strategies, the so-called best strategy which might only turn out to be the strategy which gives 
a single player the highest payoff if playing one-on-one -on -one against all the other strategies in a computer tournament, for example, that would be quote unquote, the best strategy. Uh, but that is once again, relative to the other strategies in the population, because for any population of strategic agents, it's always the case that one will emerge in a given kind of competition. One will emerge as perhaps best in that population, but then you can always create or add another strategy to the population such that it will do better than the ones you started with. And then in that new population, you can always find some new strategy, which if you add it to that new population, it will do better. Again, depending what you mean by better as an overall measure of performance. And there are many ways of doing that in prisoner's dilemma settings. So what that means is that in the iterated case, and indeed in the end player case, we don't really resolve it either. You could say we get a more desirable or a less desirable outcome. And I think that's certainly fair. I mean, I would say, and again, you, you're free to disagree. I, I would say if we manage to clean up the oceans, for example, um, that would be a much more desirable outcome, not only for us uh, as humans, but it would be more desirable for the biosphere of the earth, for our overall ecosystem, not to mention coral reefs, not to mention all the other um, um, ecosystems that the ocean itself contains. So I think cleaning up the oceans uh, would be a wonderful thing. It would be a desirable. Uh, my signal keeps dropping. Uh, can you all hear me again? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting here watching Zoom disappear uh, for no re apparent reason and then and then reappear again uh, seconds later. Uh, so in any case, I, I was talking about the oceans. Were you all able to hear that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So Let I'm saying that- I'm gonna repost the question that I asked in somebody else. You're going to have to repost them because what it's doing when it crashes uh, is basically erasing the questions. And I know there were a couple of other questions in the chat room. So pardon me or pardon Zoom. Uh, okay, here we go. Abdullah's question just came back. And Gianna's question uh, apparently just came back as well. Good. So let me just finish answering this question about the, uh, about the prisoner's dilemma. Um, so we can have either more or less desirable outcomes, but those aren't exactly resolutions. And the reason I just wanted to add, even if we all cooperated in an end-person prisoner's dilemma, like stop polluting the oceans was my example, then we would have arguably a more desirable outcome, but that doesn't resolve the dilemma. Why? Because remember the relationship that we discovered that some of you actually very, I think very press, very cleverly or insightfully realized that uh, exists between the end person prison dilemma and Hobbesian state of nature. Although Hobbes is three centuries before uh, the, the, the emergence of this model, uh, his state of nature when, in which basically everyone's defecting is, is quite congruent with the idea of a prisoner's dilemma in which everyone's defecting. And the problem is that even when you have a social contract, there will still be people who will violate it, right? So you could say if a majority of people cooperate in a prisoner's dilemma, maybe you're going to get, or arguably you're going to get a desirable outcome, but even that will not resolve the dilemma because there may always be people who opt out. There may always be some defectors who are free riding on the system or who are preying on and are exploiting the cooperators. You understand what I mean? So in that sense, the dilemma is never resolved because it would really depend on a kind of perpetual state of cooperativeness. And as Hobbes tells us, uh, we may not agree with him, but as, as he tells us, we are by nature uh, self-regarding and, and somewhat competitive human beings. So that means that there's always gonna be potential for some people to be tempted to defect and maybe especially if everybody's cooperating. Uh, so the defectors may think they're gonna get away with it. And that will then impose uh, additional transaction costs on the cooperators. We call that free riding, right? So basically there you have it. Uh, there's, no, there's no permanent resolution. 
And that's why the model continues to be interesting as a research tool in various kinds of social settings, psychological settings, economic settings, uh, decision theoretic settings, and so forth. I guess if we could resolve it, Melody, we wouldn't pay any more attention to it. We'd say, okay, it's done, it's resolved, let's move on. But because it's not resolvable in that sense, it continues to be of interest. And that's the most complete answer that, that I can give in this sort of abbreviated time. So let's move on. Um, Gianna's question is to, regarding the tragedy of the commons. So this is a segue from the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, does the uh, tragedy of the commons uh, follow people who are greedy or, or not? Is there any extension to the rule? Well, again, I, I'm not so sure that it, f I mean, do you mean it follows from greedy behavior? Yes, if everybody is trying to maximize their own expected utility, um, that, that doesn't necessarily lead to cooperation, right? If everyone's being individually rational and trying to do what's best for them, then you remember the original model, Jana, that every, every farmer adds an additional animal to his or her herd and grazes that animal on the commons. That's individually rational. You're going to end up getting more uh, utility for your own uh, benefit. The more animals you add to your herd, the better you do. So Gareth Hardin certainly argues in his seminal paper, and that's in your folders, I hope some of you've read it, uh, that this inevitably leads to ruin for all because the, there's no disincentive in the short run to not adding animals to your herd, and there's every incentive to do it. And, and if Hobbes is right and if Hardin is right, then none of us is really looking very far beyond the end of our own noses. We're all concerned with what's in front of us and you know what's best for us in this moment. And uh, you can even see this in some of our uh, political and economic systems. I mean, CEOs are subsisting from one quarterly report to the next. They may have long-term strategies, but their own heads are on the block if they don't get a good quarterly report. So they're looking three months ahead. Our politicians are looking only ahead to the next election. And in some states, legislators are elected every two years. So they have to basically... No sooner have they been elected, they have to start campaigning for the next election. So how much can they really get done? In that sense, short-term personal interest is not necessarily a guarantor of medium-term or longer-term collective benefit. And so the tragedy of the commons crops up again and again for these reasons. And it's just how we're made. We need to be able to resist, perhaps, uh, the temptation to be individually rational and, and maximize our own profits in the short run in order to look further down the road and see what that behavior does and results in if everybody engages in it to excess. And if everyone's greedy, uh, back to you, Gianna, specifically, your question, but what if everyone's greedy? Well, what if we're in a culture which encourages greed and rewards greed and therefore tempts more people to be greedy? Uh, then Hardin would say uh, the inevitable result of that is ruin uh, and that everyone will be ruined. And so that's basically the, sh you know, the, short, the short answer. Not an optimistic answer, but maybe a realistic answer. And so the, the way to avert this seems to me clearly to be um, for people individually to be mindful that what they do affects the collective as well. That it's, in our, it's actually in our own self-interest to be mindful of others if you like, that may sound self-contradictory in a fundamental sense, but I think if you protract the results in the long run, that if we are less mindful of ourselves and more mindful of others at key times, then we all do better as a result. Whereas if we're more mindful of ourselves and less mindful of others, then we all suffer, or most of us suffer as a result. Does that make sense to you, Gianna? Yeah, I just needed a little bit, you know, a little review regarding that but yeah i totally remember now okay good all right well i hope that's clear uh so we have more more a little more now we'll go to abdullah um okay back to zeno all right i think uh, a couple of you emailed me about this and uh, uh so let's revisit now we'll shift gears and and revisit zeno's achilles paradox uh, abdullah writes i know that if achilles moves ahead uh to catch up with the tortoise, the tortoise will still be ahead in the race. I'm still a little confused. 
Uh, is there a winner of this race? If not, then how does Zeno explain the paradox? Okay, well, I'll try to recapitulate it uh, from the beginning. Uh, we know that Achilles runs much faster than the tortoise. Uh, and if we're measuring their speed uh, with a radar gun, we know Achilles is a much faster runner, but we give the tortoise a head start, right? Zeno is supposing uh, from the beginning of this problem that the tortoise gets a certain head start and, and only when the tortoise reaches a certain point is Achilles permitted to start running. And we know that Achilles will very swiftly make up that distance. That is the distance between uh, uh, where the tortoise is when Achilles uh, started running and the start line. So Achilles will get to where the tortoise was in a much shorter time. But even so, in that same time that will have elapsed, the tortoise will have moved a little further ahead. Uh, and therefore, Achilles has to catch again, ca is still catching up. And moreover, although the tortoise now will have gotten less far ahead, uh, depending again exactly how far it depends on the relative velocities, which we assume to be constant. But by the time Achilles gets to where the tortoise was, the tortoise is a little further ahead. Achilles will get there again in, in much less time, but the tortoise will still by that time have moved a little further ahead and so forth. And by uh, protracting that argument or iterating that argument, Zeno seems to be showing us that Achilles could never catch the tortoise. And this is a paradox precisely because we know there must be something wrong with the argument. We know from our own common sense, which is always a dangerous thing to appeal to because it can often be wrong. But if we appeal to common sense in our life experience, we know that Achilles is bound to catch the tortoise. On, on the condition, just in case the race is long enough, right? I mean, let's also understand that a part of what's implicit in this paradox is that we're assuming a long enough race, because if the race is too short, then uh, the tortoise will win. Uh, again, depending on the head start. If you give the tortoise a big enough head start and you make the race short enough, it may be mathematically impossible for Achilles to catch the tortoise just because the race is too short. You know, if you give someone a head start to the point that they cross the finish line before you start running, uh, they win the race, right? It doesn't matter how quickly you can run. Uh, if you give them a head start to the finish line, they're going to finish before you get there. But we're assuming that the race is quite long. And so there's plenty of time for Achilles in principle, at least, to catch the tortoise. But then the question is, wh wh where's the flaw in Zeno's argument? Because Zeno's saying every time Achilles, as long as you give the tortoise a head start every time every time Zeno gets to where uh, sorry every time Achilles gets to where the tortoise was the tortoise is a little further ahead Achilles gets to that point again but the tortoise is a little further ahead so how does Achilles catch the tortoise and the, the answer is actually quite straightforward although you have to wrap your mind around it Zeno's actually showing us something that he did not intend to show he's showing us something that's quite correct uh, but it involves a, a, a rather strange property, in this case, of a certain kind of infinity of subdivision of an interval. What, what, what in plain words Zeno is illustrating, it's not what he intended to illustrate, but what his argument is telling us is the following, that there is no final instant at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. And that argument, however many times you iterate it, uh, or, or by induction, keep keep maintaining that will will indeed bear up the this conclusion that there is no final instant at which Achilles fails to overtake the tortoise. Uh, but there is always going to be, if the race goes on long enough, a first instant at which Achilles draws level with the tortoise, and from that moment on, Achilles will be ahead. Although, again, you could also turn the argument, if you like, inside out. Uh, or through the looking glass and say, although there is a first instant at which Achilles draws level with the tortoise, and that precise instant can be computed if you know the relative velocities, if, and if you know how much of a head start the tortoise gets, you can very easily do the math. It's just high school math, and it will tell you exactly their point of intersection. But then after that, uh, Achilles will always be ahead, uh, and will obviously win the race if it's long enough. Perhaps at the risk of confusing you more, I will also add something that Zeno didn't add. Just as there's no final instant at which Achilles fails to overtake the tortoise, so there's also no first instant 
at which he succeeds. <laughs> Although he will, at a certain very specifiable instant, draw level with the tortoise. And we know that every instant after that, that you care to name, Achilles will indeed be ahead. There is no first such instant on any list that you could make. And the reason for this has nothing to do with running a race. It has to do with the properties of numbers. Uh, if I ask you this question, and this may totally clear things up for some of you, uh, or may indeed, I hope for a few of you, uh, I hope not confuse you further, but here's the point. Suppose I ask you, what is the, um, what is the largest number we get to before the, reaching the number one? Suppose we're on a number line from zero to one, and we're, doing, we're talking about real numbers now. Oh, we could do it with, with, with fractions also, but with, with real numbers. What's the largest number that still falls short of one? You understand the question? What's what's the biggest number that's still less than one? No, nobody's answering. Um, what about 0.999? Okay, Abdullah says 0.9. Um, no, uh, Jana, Jana. The, the number one is not smaller than the number one. I'm asking you, what is the largest number that's smaller than one? Right? The largest number that's smaller than one is not one. One equals one. The largest number that's smaller than one, uh, we've now precipitated a string of answers, which are going to lead us to what, what Zeno is saying. Abdullah says 0. 0.9. Yeah, that's close to one. But then Raquel says, what about 0. 0.9999? And that's bigger than 0.9, but still short of one. Now, I hope you see that this goes on infinitely. We can just keep adding nines to that string. Zero point. anything but what I've done throughout this whole term, which is uh, speak to you on this platform and speak with you on this platform. But every few minutes, uh, Zoom is basically crashing, although it reinstates itself very quickly. So again, I'm going to ask you to please bear with me. It's also going to be, yeah, it's a bad day for Zoom. That's for sure. But because it's a bad day for Zoom, it's turning into a difficult day for all of us. And it also means when I come to upload this thing to YouTube, uh, it's going to be a nightmare because I'm going to end up um, getting uh, as many segments of this lecture as times that Zoom crashes. Maybe we have to stop talking about Zeno uh, because it seems like Zoom is now imitating Zeno. Uh, we keep crashing. And I'm wondering how many times it could crash before we get to the end of the lecture. And it's starting to sound like a Zeno problem because it could in fact, crash an infinite number of times, and then I would never be able to upload anything. So let's hope it stops crashing. Um, I will eventually download um, all of the segments, uh, if in, unless it's still recording in the background. I mean, that would be optimal. Uh, then I just can upload one segment, and it'll have these these blank spots in it. Okay, so back to back to the problem. And again, I, I apologize, those of you who've who've asked questions, we'll have to, again, the ones I haven't got to yet, you need to re-enter them. So do you understand that we could, in, in answer to the question, what's the largest number uh, that's smaller than one? We could just keep adding nines. 0.9 uh, is the first approximation. 0.99 is, is bigger, but still less than one. And, and you can add an infinite number of nines and never reach one. Do you understand this? We can keep adding nines to that uh, decimal expansion but we'll never get to one. And that's exactly what Zeno is illustrating. That no matter how many times the tortoise, uh, you know, where, how many times Achilles reaches where the tortoise was, the tortoise go, gets a little further ahead. So just as there is no final number that's smaller than one, there is no final instant at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. There is no final number that fails 
to to catch the number one, if you like. So there's no final number. There's no final point at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. But there is a first point at which he does. And eventually we we do reach the number one. Um, and when we're moving on a racetrack, then we, we certainly uh, know that Achilles will eventually overtake the tortoise. And once again, if you know the head start specifically, you know, if you're, if you're given like a physics problem, uh, if you're given the, their velocities, which you assume to be constant, you know, the tortoise runs at a certain speed and Achilles runs at a certain speed. And if you know numerically what those speeds are, and you also know the actual distance that the tortoise is allowed to cover uh, before Achilles is permitted to start running, then you can very easily calculate their point of intersection. You will know how far down the track Achilles actually catches the tortoise. And so the winner depends on how long the race is, Abdullah. Finally, yes, uh, you could say, although that's a little ambiguous, what I would prefer to say is that if the race is long enough, Achilles will always win, right? Achilles cannot fail to overtake the tortoise given a long enough race. Uh, but exactly how long the race has to be depends specifically on how long the tortoise's head start is on, 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 and on their relative speeds, all right? So if, you, if the race is too short, Achilles might not uh, uh, catch the tortoise, but we know if the race is long enough, then of course Achilles will. And Zeno isn't assuming anything. Zeno's trying to cover that up. Zeno's trying to tell us that Achilles will never catch the tortoise. I mean, you, 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 you need to understand what Zeno is doing. He's trying to argue against the possibility of motion altogether. And he's trying to pick apart the idea that anything can go anywhere. Um, so you need not to lose sight of, 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 of Zeno's ulterior motive in these paradoxes. He's trying to discredit our commonsensical notions of motion. So is, is that all right now? That's better? According to Abdullah, yes. <laughs> okay. Now there's another question from, from Melody. Uh, and we're back to principles of choice. Melody says she wants to clarify what happens to the principle of choice when moving from the one-shot case to the iterated case. Is it correct to say that the probability of each decision now becomes more than 50-50 because what you've seen the other person do before you make? Okay. So Melody, let's just, just tease that question apart. <laughs> Uh, the probability of each decision um, is 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 uh, not necessarily 50-50 at all. Um, to begin with, if you walk into a prisoner's dilemma and you have already decided that you're going to defect, you've already decided on the dominance principle, then uh, then uh, you know that that part of the dilemma is is decided by you. Uh, and so there's going to be no probability of joint cooperation if you decide, you know, previous to actually choosing, you've already decided what you're going to choose. And if the other prisoners already decided what they're going to choose, then there, there's no 50-50 probability of anything because it's been predetermined by both players. But what we're asking about is a more subtle, I mean, I think your question is more subtle and you're, you're really talking about maximizing expected utilities, uh, let's say in the one shot case to start with. And remember the justification for cooperating in the one shot case is if you think, it's not the probability of each decision, but if you think that the other player will cooperate if you do, it's a conditional because they're linked, right? The outcomes are always linked to what both players do. So the, the more sophisticated or the more nuanced way of saying this, and therefore the correct way of saying this, is that if you think or you believe that the probability of the other player cooperating, if you do, is greater than 50%, greater than 50-50, then indeed you know that maximizing expected utilities will prescribe that you cooperate. Because you do the math and you'll see that given the structure of the prisoner's dilemma, the, uh, the transitive ordering of the payoffs is such that always it's the case that if there's a greater than 50, 50 chance that both players cooperate, then the utility or expected utility of cooperation will be greater than the expected utility of defection. And that's the principle that 
contrast with dominance. That's the principle that will prescribe that you cooperate. Now you're asking what happens, and your question is really a good one now, just to clarify, I hope I clarified the terminology in which we approach this. But now you're asking what happens when we move to the iterated case, and that's a really great question. So now you have a history, if you're told, and again, depending on how social psychologists conduct the actual experiment, and there's a whole host of ways and a whole number of conditions under which uh, social psychologists and others have conducted this experiment. There's a huge literature on it. We'll just give you a quick example, and I'm going to answer your question, but to give you a quick example, um, if you suppose that you're playing now, let's say hypothetically we're playing with identical twins, uh, and there's some reason to suppose perhaps that identical twins or even fraternal twins would play much more like each other than unlike each other, right? So if you were imagine that you're in a one-shot prisoner's dilemma, uh, and your fellow prisoner is your identical twin, uh, you would maybe on some accounts, you would have a much higher degree of confidence in believing that if you cooperate, your twin is going to cooperate too. And so you would want to cooperate uh, for that reason. Um, but again, maybe not. That would depend on, on what evolutionary psychology and biology and social psychology has to say about twins uh, in, in this kind of situation. Do you know them? Yeah, we're assuming, Taisha, that you have some twin you've grown up with. Okay, so you know each other and you very much alike. You know how identical twins often dress alike and look alike and obviously, but also behave alike. And even when separated at birth, there are experiments that show even when separated at birth, that identical twins often manifest very similar characteristics, be it uh, taste and fashion or other things. So there may be some genetic basis for asserting this. In any case, we would imagine on that view that two identical twins caught in a, a prisoner's dilemma uh, would probably cooperate uh, because each one would think, yeah, there's a much greater than 50-50 chance that they're going to do what I do. Uh, so uh, if I cooperate, probably they'll cooperate, and that means we can get the Pareto optimal outcome. <laughs> yeah, unless they both have a gene which leads them to, to be exploiters, in which case they're both going to hope the other one cooperates so they could exploit the other one, and they may end up in the Nash equilibrium. That wouldn't disprove the hypothesis. It would just indicate that identical twins perhaps play more alike than randomly paired people. And yes, uh, uh, one of you says you learned that in psychology. Yeah, this is very, leads to a very interesting set of psychological experiments to test this hypothesis about twins. Uh, but in any case, your question, back to your question, Melody. So if you think whether it's a twin or not, if you think the probability of, of uh, mutual cooperation is greater than 50-50, then you should cooperate. And because your expected utility of doing so will be higher than, than it would be if you defect. But now you're asking what happens in the iterated case. And now we have an interesting uh, new kind of evidence that we can introduce. Because if you are playing an iterated game, and if you are on, on the condition that you're being told what the previous outcomes are, in other words, let's say you know you're playing 100 moves and you're keeping score because there's some numerical value attached to the payoffs, uh, and you're sort of competing against the other player, uh, as long as you're told what the previous outcome was, then you can very easily compute the probability of what will happen next uh, or the probability of the other player's cooperation based not on a subjective belief, as you have to do in the one-shot case because you have no other real ground to, to formulate one, but in an iterated case, probability can be interpreted as an empirical frequency. In other words, you, you can really just put together a matrix of past outcomes, and you could see the frequency um, of, of the mutual cooperation outcome, the frequency of the, uh, you know, the mutual defection outcome, and the frequency of the two asymmetric outcomes. Suppose there have been 100 trials already with you and the same person, and, and suppose that in uh, more than 50% of the cases, uh, when you cooperated, the other person did. And in fewer than 50% of the cases, uh, when you uh, defected, the other person did. So you know, therefore, that based on the frequency of past outcomes, probability now is a measure of, measure of, of, of history, right? A measure of empirical frequency. Uh, then you know that the probability 
um, of cooperation in such a case would be greater than that of defection. On the other hand, if you had both defected 99 times <laughs> out of the 100 trials, then you would know that the probability of mutual defection is much higher uh, than, uh, than, than, than of mutual cooperation, and therefore much less than 50-50 for mutual cooperation. So maximizing expected utility in such a case would actually converge with dominance and would tell you to defect. So in other words, a short answer is if we now, because we have a history and we can look at past outcomes, we can interpret probability as empirical frequency. And that would give us a much more accurate measure, at least with those two players, of what their strategies are. And so you would make perhaps a more informed choice on that basis. So um, is that is that clear, Melody and others? Is that a um, is that a clear answer? Yeah, definitely makes sense. Good. Okay. Well, it's good when we when when philosophy makes sense, then we're all happy. <laughs> all right. Um, so, are there any other? These are really good questions, very important ones, and <clears throat> we did not have really a lot of time uh, during the actual first run through of this material to to re-emphasize some of the more subtle and and also I think more interesting points but we have that opportunity now okay so now Ahmed has a question uh, about Zeno again uh, is he trying to tell us that everything goes on forever uh, no he's not trying to tell us that at all um, please please uh, Ahmed understand uh, what what I think at least what I think Zeno was trying to tell us uh, he's not asserting that everything goes on forever. Um, and that's a, a very big doctrine about the world. Uh, and we don't know if everything goes on forever. Uh, Zeno was trying to tell us actually that that in some respects, motion as we perceive it and experience it doesn't really happen at all. So that's a, a much more reduced and, and a much more modest, although quite improbable or implausible thesis. Um, so... 0.9999 goes on forever because uh, there is no end to the number of nines that we can add. But what that is telling us in the context of the Achilles problem is that there can be no final instant. I'll repeat it. There can be no final instant at which Achilles fails to overtake the tortoise. Motion is not the same as infinity. It's the fact that if you're trying to catch something that is slower than you and that thing that's moving slower than you has been given a head start then it is demonstrable and and Zeno's demonstrated it that there's no final instant at which you fail to catch it but just because there is no final instant so you could say I mean not to completely uh, deny your assertion you could say that Zeno would go on infinitely long failing to catch the tortoise, but not infinitely long in time. Only infinitely long as we seek arbitrarily to continue dividing the distance between them. But again, the key and overriding feature of this problem and the, and the, the insight that resolves the paradox is that just because there is no last instant at which Achilles fails to overtake the tortoise does not imply that there is no first instance at which he succeeds. That is the resolution of, the, of that paradox. I'll repeat it. The fact that there is no final instant at which Achilles fails to overtake the tortoise does not imply that there is no first instant at which he succeeds. Indeed, there is a first instant at which he succeeds just in case the race is long enough and we know the relative speeds, we can compute that first instant. So Achilles will catch up to the tortoise. And we, we can say exactly, we can predict, given the constancy of their speeds, we can predict exactly where on the track that intersection will occur. And we know that it will. It's just that there is no final instant at which he will fail to catch him because you could say that space is infinitely divisible. But just because, to put it now in a geometric context rather than an arithmetic one, just because any interval of space that you choose to be at a foot or a yard or a mile, uh, 
or, or a light year, whatever, whatever interval you choose of distance, just because that distance can be infinitely subdivided uh, doesn't mean that the distance itself is infinite. And I hope that answers your question, maybe in a more comprehensive sense. So how many subdivisions can you make of an interval of one inch? In other words, how many points does it contain? Another way of asking the question, how many points does it contain? It contains an infinite number of points. But just because it contains an infinite number of points, Ahmed, doesn't mean that it in itself, the interval in itself, is infinite. All right? The, in the interval, we've already said, is one inch. But one inch, an interval of one inch definitely contains an infinite number of points. But so does an interval of one foot or one yard or one kilometer or one mile. Now, this in itself raises a new paradox, at least uh, I, I think in some sense, because how can something that is of finite length contain an infinite number of points, right? Well, it does. Um, but it doesn't mean that it itself is infinite in length. So we have to distinguish, therefore, between the interval and the number of points it contains. Is clear? We have to, we have to distinguish between an interval, uh, which is a finite length by definition, um, we're always specifying the length of an interval, and it's a finite length. And we have to distinguish between that and uh, and the number of points it contains, which is always infinite. And that was the Galileo, I think, was the first one to realize this, if I'm not mistaken, historically. And it was a, a complete a complete paradox to him too. Although it settles Zeno's hash, it tells us something very bizarre. And then Cantor went on to reveal even more bizarre things. Uh, in the late 19th century, because of course it turns out that the implication of what we just said, this is nothing to do with Zeno anymore, but it has to do with this, this baffling uh, notion about infinity, one, one of many baffling notions, uh, is, that, is that it turns out that therefore an interval of, a, of an inch uh, contains exactly the same number of points as an interval of a mile. Although you might, in your commonsensical way, suppose that a mile being much longer than an inch must have a greater number of points. No, uh, we can divide an inch in, into an infinite number of points, and we can divide a mile into an infinite number of points. And moreover, as Cantor showed, we can put them into one-to-one -one correspondence. So the infinity of points that an inch contains is exactly of the same cardinal uh, magnitude as an infinity of points that a mile contains. And he showed us something worse uh, at the risk of now taking us far, far away from Zeno, uh, so to speak, but, but, you know, not far from infinity. It's also demonstrable that the points on a plane, um, the number of points in a, in, a, in a, you know, plane figure like a square are the same number of points as uh, on any of the lines of the square. And I think you can also protract this dimensionally so that the number of points that a cube contains in its volume are the same number of points as any of its sides contain in their length, uh, which is really bizarre. Uh, but that just shows you that perhaps the human mind is not uh, evolved uh, easily to get a handle on infinities. Uh, but I'm glad you see this. And now you want to know, um, yes, Melody, you may have to listen to the uh, to this upload. Uh, and I can't predict whether it will clarify or confuse things further, but that's a separate, really, infinity and the mathematics of infinity and the philosophy of infinity are, 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 are very interesting, but kind of separate topics in their own ways. Um, Ahmed says, I wonder what Newton and his law of motion would think of Zeno. Well, um, I, I, I'm not so sure that, I, I think that Newton would easily see the resolution to the paradoxes. Uh, I don't think this would pose any problem at all for Newton. Um, but what would be more interesting, I think, would be Einstein. Uh, because of special relativity and uh, what, what we end up with is as we accelerate bodies uh, there, as we know, their mass uh, uh, increases uh, as their velocity. And we also know that they, uh, the, the length uh, shrinks in, <laughs> in the direction of motion. And we also know that time slows down if they happen to be carrying a clock. So uh, motion, as we understand it in relativistic domains, is a very different thing from motion that Newton understood in obviously what we today call Newtonian domains. And what Zeno understood and what Newton understood were the same things. They assumed that properties like length and mass and time were 
constant properties somehow woven into the fabric of existence and that they, they couldn't be toyed with. And so it's against a uh, supposition of absolute uh, space and time that uh, Zeno's paradoxes are configured and indeed that Newton's laws of motion are configured. But if you then move into relativistic domains or also quantum domains for different reasons, then our everyday notions, because we inhabit Newtonian worlds, you know, Newtonian spaces, but our everyday notions will be very much uh, changed in special relativistic domains where mass, length, and time are not fixed at all. They're not absolutes at all. And space-time itself is, is in general relativity. Space-time itself is not, is not a fixed thing. Space is not a container uh, of matter. In fact, space is bent by, by gravity. We know this. Uh, so uh, it, the world gets much more bizarre. And physics continuously, I think particularly modern physics, in the last uh, 125 years has shown us that the universe is a much stranger place uh, than we ever thought it was. But that would take us far afield from philosophy 101. I just want you to, to understand um, what was baffling to Zeno about infinity is no longer baffling to us in the same way. So we can resolve all his paradoxes, okay? Yes, that's exactly right, Ahmad. You finally found uh, a nice way of wording it. Uh, Zeno was trying to say that the distance to the finish line keeps getting smaller, so you'll never catch up. Well, the distance to where, the, the, the distance to between you and the tortoise, if you're Achilles, the distance between you and the tortoise keeps getting smaller, but you'll never catch up. But not that you'll never catch up. Again, you have to get rid of that phrase, never catch up. This phrase is totally derailing you. It's not the case that you'll never catch up. It's the case that there will be no final instant at which you fail to catch up. Again, I have to keep returning to this. I have to take this phrase of yours and completely uh, uh, get rid of it in order for this problem to be clarified. It's not the case that you'll never catch up. It's the case that there is no final instant at which you fail to catch up but that there is no final incident which you fail to catch up if you're Achilles trying to catch a tortoise. The fact that there is no final incident at which you fail to catch up does not mean that there is no first instant at which you succeed in catching up. I keep repeating this in different ways. Until this point is, is actually absorbed by you fully, I don't think that you'll see that the resolution of the paradox is actually quite simple. Um, but in any case, won't calculus disprove zero? Well, uh, fortunately for us, uh, Zeno only knew Euclidean geometry. Had Zeno known calculus, he, he might have been able to pose some, some really devilish or diabolical paradoxes. But, uh, you know, calculus can, can, can do a lot of different things. And if we start introducing infinitesimals now into the argument, we, we may end up either solving some questions, but possibly posing others. So I would prefer to leave calculus out of this uh, and not start introducing infinitesimals and limits. Um, although you, you, you can use them uh, in convergent series. I'll just say this. I know not everyone's taking calculus, but uh, to Ahmed's point, look, we know that some series converge uniformly toward a limit. All right. And in that case, we can also use that information in a way to partially resolve uh, some of Zeno's paradoxes. For example, the, the first paradox that you can't leave the room, right? Uh, because why you have to get halfway there and to, before you get halfway there, you have to get a quarter of the way there and so forth. So we know, thanks to, to the properties of, of convergent series, that there is a finite sum to that infinite series. And so we know that if we, if we take these distances uh, and and just keep having them, uh, we know actually we are going to be able to get there because a half plus a quarter uh, plus an eighth plus a sixteenth plus a thirty second plus one over two to the n dot 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 uh, is both infinite but also has a finite sum. So we're back to this. Uh, no matter how many terms you take, uh, you'll never get to that sum. But if you take all of them, you will. <laughs> okay. Which means we can get to the good news is you can leave the room. 
but you can't leave the room because that series has a, has a, a, a finite sum. You can leave the room because every time you take a step, you're stepping across an, a finite interval that contains an infinite number of points. <laughs> okay? And th those are two different claims. But yeah, the series has a final answer and it converges. That's right. So that's another way of explaining to Zeno how it is we manage uh, to get to, to the door. But then Zeno can still tell us, yeah, but you have to take an infinite number of steps to get there. And you can't take a number, an infinite number of steps. And so the fact that we know from calculus that the series has a, a, a finite sum uh, doesn't actually give an answer to Zeno because Zeno is going to say, yeah, but to get to that sum, you, 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 could, you, you have to, how, how can you take an infinite number of steps? Even if you live for a hundred years, you can't take an, even if you spend all day, you could never take an infinite number of steps. Yes, you can never win with Zeno. Well, you can never win with Zeno because Zeno's playing field isn't level to use, a, to use a metaphor on top of a metaphor. Zeno's playing field isn't level because the assumptions that he's making in order to run his paradoxes are, are, are not flawless. So if you're going to play according to Zeno's rules, you won't win and you won't get anywhere. But if we want to play according to a more co coherent set of rules, then indeed we can resolve his paradoxes. <laughs> and again, the answer is that we don't need to take an infinite number of steps to reach the door because every time we take a step, it's crossing, we're crossing a finite interval we're an interval of finite length, and we accept that we're also traversing an infinite number of points, but that doesn't stop us from taking a finite step. So we can ignore infinity in that case and still get where we're going. Just as Achilles can ignore infinity. Achilles is not troubled by the thought, he, just in case Achilles is also a mathematician. Achilles is not deterred or slowed down by the idea that there's an infinite number of moments at which he's going to fail to catch the tortoise. It doesn't bother him because he knows that if he keeps running, he will catch the tortoise just in case the race is long enough. So is this, is this providing clarity for you? I hope, uh, I hope not more confusion at least. But if those of you who, who are interested in confusion or who like this kind of confusion or puzzlement, or wonder, uh, you should definitely read Cantor's work on, I'm going to type this in, Cantor's work on transfinite numbers, transfinite numbers. Uh, Cantor did amazing work showing us that we could actually manipulate infinities in some ways using using traditional mathematics, just extending it a little bit. Uh, we can actually manipulate infinities, but infinities have different arithmetic properties, obviously, uh, that finite numbers don't possess. And what Cantor was able to demonstrate with his work on transfinite numbers was that there are actually different categories of infinity. So it turns out that some infinities are larger than others, believe it or not. We would think infinity is, is one kind of term referring to anything that increases without bound, but that's not quite true. While in perhaps in, in calculus, certainly infinity means increasing without bound. Uh, in Cantorian mathematics, uh, we can find that some infinities are actually larger than others, which is quite bizarre. Um, but anyway, you can read Cantor. I'm not going to cover that in this course, certainly, but there may be flaws. There may be mathematics courses that deal with it. And there are certainly some very popular books on Cantor that you could read uh, and, and which will probably uh, blow your minds or certainly uh, make you more puzzled than you thought you could be over this notion of something continuing without bound. Uh, are, are there, we have about 10 minutes. Uh, are there any other questions pertaining to the material? We've done a lot this morning. I'm glad that you brought these questions up. Uh, very good on your part to ask for clarification on the prisoner's dilemma and various aspects of it on tragedy of the commons and on, on, on Zeno's paradox. Uh, do you have any other uh, questions that you'd like to ask? Uh, 
Okay. Well, that's good too. If you're satisfied, then that's fine. And uh, Ahmed is seconding Melody after rewatch, as you may want to rewatch. This is partly why we're uh, uploading these things and, and making them available asynchronously. Uh, I still prefer Classroom. I, I think on balance, it's up to you to decide too, by the way. I, I mean, you're going to evaluate the course. I've just received a link and I'll be sending it to, to my uh, main group of, of 80 in section M and your other instructors probably received these links as well uh, to a, a course and teacher survey. Uh, the college has finally got that set up online for you. I'm going to send the link to my group today. Uh, you'll be able to go online uh, and complete a survey of this course and a survey of, of, of the professor, in this case yours truly, but each of you uh, in, in the whole, uh, you know, the whole number of offerings, uh, everybody who's in this plenary uh, will be able to go to your own uh, particular breakout section and evaluate the course and also evaluate your instructor. Uh, so please do that. Uh, we get a statistical breakdown of your feedback, which is useful. And uh, it takes them a while to compile it, but we do get a statistical breakdown. We also get your individual comments, uh, not identified by you. They are, they're anonymous. When we get them, we just get a list of comments. We don't know who said what, but the comments are useful as well. And I hope that on the online version, you you, you should have, I'm, I'm assuming that, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, but I assume they'll give you space in which you can make comments as well as, as paint by numbers in terms of the survey. So please take advantage of that. And uh, so will I uh, keep the video up on YouTube? Sure, um, uh, Gene, I, I don't plan on, uh, on, on deleting them. Um, I'm probably gonna add to them as I, I think at the moment, I'll be doing this again next term actually with a different group, obviously. Um, but uh, I will continue to keep the channel live. Um, and if that serves some purpose or some benefit, then so be it. Absolutely, I'll leave them up there. Okay. Um, and and the interesting question is that we're uh, allowed to do this. Uh, it's um, something that uh, is in our contract. It turned out to be a legal question when we were debating how this course would be conducted fully online uh, and whether it was appropriate to upload to a public platform like YouTube. Uh, we got a ruling from the university, uh, which is that uh, professors actually own uh, the content of the lectures. So we, we are, we have, in other words, legal uh, copy or intellectual property um, uh, rights to our own lectures, although we're employed by the university and obviously conform to university policies and, and guidelines uh, for teaching, but we own the intellectual property. So it means that we're entitled if we wish to upload those, uh, those lectures to YouTube or to any public platform. And, and that's uh, a choice I was happy to make. Uh, so they'll be up there. Um, is this the last class for you? Yes, uh, Ahmed. Well, I have one more class tomorrow in another course, but as far as the, this uh, Philosophy 10200 is concerned, uh, yes, this is our last class. Uh, our breakout group will not meet Thursday because classes will be over by Thursday. So this is indeed the last class uh, in this course that I'll be teaching this term, correct. Any other questions? Well, that's very nice of you. Um, uh, I'm so glad to hear uh, that, that it's been interesting for you. Um, and I will miss you too. I enjoy these interactions. Uh, I mean, we're all in the same boat you know, kind of cooped up uh, where we are. I'm not traveling at all. And uh, uh, so I get to interact with, this is the biggest group of people I get to interact with each week. And also I must say, many of you have been very participatory. Uh, you've, been, you've been engaged. Uh, you've been asking great questions, giving feedback. Um, and, and it's been, uh, in that sense, I think you have made the most of this opportunity. Uh, I hope you um, you agree that we've done the best we can for you 
Uh, I mean, as an institution, we we made this transition. We migrated back in March, uh, and and we tried to to keep you on track with your academic careers. That's been our ambition, uh, in spite of all the problems that COVID is posing to us uh, and continues to pose. We have wanted to continue to serve you as as a public university. And uh, when the college was open, Ahmed, I was doing a, a jumbo. Usually I would be doing a jumbo. My 80 uh, students would assemble in one of the auditoriums in the NAC downstairs, and, and I would have the in-person lecture there. Yes, that's right. But there is one advantage, as we've discovered, I think many of you have discovered, that, that at least doing it this way, you get to see the lecture again um, because it's up there on YouTube, but your convenience is asynchronous. So I think you get the best of both worlds in that sense. Maybe not the best of both. I still think it's better to be in the classroom. Um, I find it more interesting to engage in a live setting with real people rather than this disembodied way. But it is very helpful. I know that uh, it's helpful from the number of views of the videos I can see that it's great that you get to rewatch them. Um, because absolutely you don't get things the first time around, especially with philosophy. Well, Melody, if you got everything the first time around, I probably wouldn't be doing my job. Remember, my, as I said on day one, my job is to challenge you and to, uh, you know, to get you to think outside the box, as it were, and to make and to make it possible for you to subvert your own beliefs at times. So I think that if you're not puzzled sometimes by what goes on in a philosophy class, then you're either you're not paying attention or you're not in a philosophy class. So it's good to be able to review it. But those of you who are going on to graduate school, those of you who have plans to continue, and I hope that some of you or many of you do, then you should know that in graduate school, it gets worse. I'm just letting you know this is not a, it's not a cautionary tale or a warning, or I'm not trying to scare you off. I'm just saying I experienced it. Everybody who's a professor experiences it. As an undergraduate, it's actually expected that you're going to understand more of what goes on in a given class, like maybe 50 to 75% of what goes on. And in some cases, maybe all of it, but at least you'll get more than half. And then you can go back and, and review uh, our lectures on YouTube or study the text and figure it out. Eventually you'll get there. But when you get to graduate school, you may have a different experience. I, I remember being in graduate lectures where I was lucky to understand half of what went on. And I really had to do a lot more work um, to, to figure out um, what was being taught. And especially in the, in the sciences, uh, mathematics and, and other kinds of subjects you may discover, or could, could be any subject for that matter. Uh, but uh, my experience was in uh, more in the sciences. And you may discover that you walk out of a lecture having understood 10% of it. And then you really have to go home and do a lot of work. Uh, Ahmed says the chat function has a lot of people asking questions. Maybe that's true, Ahmed, and I hope it's true. And some of us had, had surmised this in agreement with you that the fact that we were doing this remotely uh, would be a benefit to some of the shyer people, perhaps people who don't want to speak up in a group or maybe shy, uh, you know, more introverted by nature and, and less and less comfortable or less confident speaking up in a, especially a large group. Uh, whereas this is a much, a much less uh, obviously uh, imposing way of asking. You could just hang out there and then enter, enter text. It's chatting is friendly. Um, and we, we still don't really see you or hear you if you don't want to be seen and heard. So we thought more people would pipe up too. But I'm not sure that's true. Um, because what we don't know, uh, and I'm not saying this in an accusatory way, but it's kind of a, you know, we don't know who's, who's logged in and then is out walking their dog, right? I mean, anything could be happening just because you're logged in on this platform. Uh, if you're muted and your video is turned off, then I don't know if you're in the room or not. Uh, so, uh, I mean, presumably you do. So we don't know whether whether this overall, this platform has been more conducive to increase participation or whether the people who normally don't participate are still not participating. I mean, I don't know if we can really know that. Um, but I'm glad those of you who perhaps would be more shy to ask questions in a live setting uh, are feeling much freer and much less pressure to, to ask questions in a chat room. So that's a great thing. I agree. It's a really great thing. Um, and, I'm, and I'm very glad of it uh, because philosophy uh, progresses uh, in this setting, not through a pure lecture, but through questions and answers and through dialogue.
so it's made me glad as a professor uh, that so many of you have uh, contributed continuously uh, with your really good questions. Uh, it also helps me to learn about teaching and helps me as a professor to know what needs to be emphasized and to know what needs to be more deeply explored. So thank you for your participation in the course. It's been really great. Uh, and again, I hope you'll have a chance. I'll be sending out the uh, link to the uh, survey for the course and professor to my own group. And uh, beyond this, I sincerely hope that, that enough of you have enjoyed this class. It may be your first, uh, for some of you, your first ever philosophy class, I guess. But I hope that we'll see you again in future philosophy courses. We have a wonderful faculty in this university. Our, my colleagues are terrific. And, and we, we teach a variety of very interesting electives. Uh, having passed this course, uh, I think that uh, most of you will be uh, uh, eligible uh, to take any elective that you want, and that would include philosophy electives. So I hope to see some of you again in the future, but I do wish you all very well in your studies. And I'll just wrap up by, by wishing everybody a very happy holiday and very safe. Uh, uh, you're more than welcome, everyone. Uh, stay very safe. Again, I know the vaccine's coming, but stay safe until it gets here and be well. Uh, and best wishes to completing your work this term. Uh, make sure you do it. And also enjoy your break. And I look forward to, to seeing you perhaps in a future class. And I do wish you all the very best with your continuing success at City College and onward. You're more than welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for your appreciation. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Okay, take good care. All the best to you and bye for now. Uh, Professor, thank you so much. I hope you have a great break. And thank you for answering all our questions. It's, it's been a care. great pleasure. You're more than welcome. And I know I'm supposed to meet with a couple of people, but we're going to move over. I have a meeting at 11 with one of you. Please move over to the course room on Blackboard. Okay, we have to hop over to the other platform for my virtual office. Okay, I'll miss all of you too. It's been a lot of fun teaching this course to you. And again, I'm very grateful for your participation. And I'll look forward to reading uh, your final essays, those of you in my group. All right, take good care, everybody. I'm stopping the recording now, and I will get this uploaded either in bits or pieces, or if I have to, I'll compile them all into one continuous video. One way or another, you'll see it up on YouTube later today. Okay, bye-bye for now. <laughs>